everybody, and welcome back to another Wheel of Time news video. Now, I know it's been a while since we've had any meaningful news to talk about, but we have a few items of interest today, and I think they are pretty relevant. And then we also have an interview with Brandon Sanderson, where he talks not only about the Wheel of Time books, but the upcoming TV show on Amazon. There is a lot of good stuff to get to. But first, let me mention the video sponsor, Audible.com. Audible has been a longtime sponsor of the channel, and what I love about this sponsorship is it's a win-win for everyone. If you aren't aware, Audible is the world's largest provider of audiobooks. Audiobooks are awesome for when you're driving around, you're on the train, you're cooking, you're mowing your lawn. It's a completely different experience, and it's a great way to reread a book. The Wheel of Time audiobooks are especially good, as Kate Redding and Michael Kramer are legends in the Wheel of Time community due to their readings of the books. Now, the reason I mentioned that it's a win-win is that you can get a free audiobook from Audible just to try out the service, and you get to keep that book whether you choose to subscribe to their service or not. And you help the channel by doing it, so everybody wins. Just head to www.audibletrial.com forward slash nameless, or click the link in the description of the video. Get your free book, I bet you will like Audible. One last plug before diving in, as many of you know, I have a podcast now. I host Tarvalin After Dark, a Wheel of Time comedy and discussion podcast with Jess, formerly of the White Tower, and now of the Omelin Study here on YouTube, and then Rakapa Sadai of the YouTube channel Wheel Talk. We do comedy sketches based around the Wheel of Time. We get into some pretty good discussions about the books, the TV show, and everything else, really. It is certainly a different type of podcast. I'm going to go ahead and play an example of one of our sketches so you can get a feel for it. I was winning too much in the end with my lucky dice, and now they are accusing me of cheating. I better call Gall. I just happened to be hanging out with a murderer, and someone saw it. Now they're accusing me of being a dark friend. Time to call Gall. I'm a high lord of Tyr, and one of the lowly peasants got mad that I murdered his brother for looking me in the eyes. Now the dragon reborn wants to cut my head off. I better call Gaul. Hi, I'm Gaul. Have you been accused of something and you don't want anyone to think you actually did it? Do you want to get away with it? I believe everyone is innocent until proven guilty, and I can make sure no one is left alive to prove you're guilty. You better call Gull. I will stab the fuck out of your accuser with spears, making sure there is no one left alive to actually find you guilty of a crime. So, if someone has accused you of a crime, or they want to kill you, I will kill them first. You better call Gull. As you can see, it's a good amount of fun. We just released a best of episode covering our best sketches from our first 15 episodes. Check it out at www.thegreatblight.com forward slash Tarval and After Dark or wherever you get your podcasts. Let's hit the spoiler warning for the video. Today's video will carry a spoiler rating of red with major spoilers running all the way through a memory of light. If you have not finished all of the books of the series, please watch this at your own risk. There will be major spoilers you have been warned. So as I mentioned, we have a couple things to get to here, but let's kick it off with a director for season two of the TV show. Wattseries.com is reporting that David Lowry is set to direct episodes in the second season of The Wheel of Time on Amazon Prime. So to get everybody up to speed, it has been confirmed by Amazon that the second season of Wheel of Time has been picked up even before the release date for season one has been released. So that indicates Amazon has quite a bit of faith in what they've seen. We have a script for episode one of season two, which I talked about in a previous video, which you can find in the description of this one or right here. But this is the first director that we have seen confirmed for season two. So who is David Lowry? Well, he is an American writer and director that is best known for directing the movies Ain't Them Body Saints, Pete's Dragon, and A Ghost Story. He's won more than 19 awards as a director at various film festivals for his indie work. And while he might not be a household name to many of you from the research I've done, it's easy to see that he is very well connected and very well esteemed as he's not only a director, 
He's also an executive producer on many projects. He's written quite a bit of stuff as well. He's connected to a couple major Hollywood actors. We don't know what episodes he's going to be directing yet, but it can be assumed that if Amazon follows the same strategy as season one, he will direct two episodes in an eight episode second season. But none of that's confirmed, so it's just kind of guessing. Next up, we're gonna talk about Jordan Khan. So after a year where Jordan Khan was forced to move completely online due to COVID, they are back this year with an in-person event, albeit a limited in-person event. Now the convention is being limited to 500 attendees. I think that's all full. So if you aren't signed up, you probably can't go now, but that's also in addition to the media that have been invited. I'm one of them. Now that's a limitation by the way, put forward by the hotel hosting the event, but nevertheless, I am still excited for the convention. Now, as it pertains to the wheel of time, the regular crew is gonna be there. Harriet McDougall, Maria Simmons, and the rest of team Jordan will all be there as well as Brandon Sanderson, who we'll come back to in a minute. Sarah Nakamura, the Wheel of Time superfan and book consultant on the TV show, will also be in attendance. Now, I know many of you watching this won't get to be there, but it's certainly an exciting time to do a convention with the TV show coming, and I'm looking forward to bringing you guys some content from there as well. I will be at the convention, and I will be participating in a panel at the convention. Now, I'm not sure that I'm allowed to say what the panel will be yet, but needless to say, I am very excited to be a part of the festivities and I'm very excited to meet a lot of you guys who are gonna be there. Let me know in the comments of the video if you are planning on being there for Jordan Con this year. Let me know also if you wanna see some content from Jordan Con. if you can't be there. I'm planning on making some. All right, let's hit the final piece of news and it is by far the most newsworthy. This past week, Brandon Sanderson was the guest on the Dusty Wheel. Now, if you aren't familiar with the Dusty Wheel, it's an incredibly novel concept for a YouTube channel and it's really, really awesome. The Dusty Wheel is a live call-in talk show about the Wheel of Time. It's hosted by Matt Hatch, famous for his work on Theoryland, which was one of the major Wheel of Time websites back in the day. If you have not checked out the Dusty Wheel or you're not subscribed to the channel, make sure to do that as that will be a hub of activity once the show is out. Not that it isn't already, it's really awesome. So you should check that out. Matt is one of the best people I know and because he's so awesome, he is friends with people like Brandon Sanderson. So anyways, Brandon Sanderson was on the Dusty Wheel this past week and I'm gonna talk about some of the things that Brandon said during the interview. Now I am not going to go through everything that he said. You should absolutely go watch the episode of the Dusty Wheel for that. I will have that episode linked in the description of this video. In regards to Brandon though, if you aren't aware, Brandon was the author who finished the last three books of the Wheel of Time series after Robert Jordan passed away. He is also consulting on the Wheel of Time television show for season one. So let's go ahead and hit some highlights from what Brandon said and I'll go ahead and add my thoughts to what he kind of told everybody. Let's start with a comment that he made when he was asked about his involvement so far in season two of the show. Again, Brandon had read and consulted on the scripts and production for season one, even taking a trip out to see the filming at one point. He confirmed during the interview that he will be involved with season two, and even as of the day of that interview, he had spoken with Rafe on the phone. He confirmed that he has read all of the season one scripts, and he has seen some of the season two scripts, but he stopped short of saying that they were completed or giving any feedback on those scripts. He went on to say that he feels like the Wheel of Time is in very, very good hands. He called Rafe a very good storyteller and somebody who is incredibly dedicated to the Wheel of Time. Now, previously, Brandon had talked a lot about the show and had mentioned something similar, but he also hinted at a few major changes, most of which he thought were very good, one of which he thought might be controversial. This time around, he made sure to let us know that Rafe and the Amazon team are not filming the books in a word for word recreation, something we already knew, but rather making changes that will make the story work on screen. Now, this is not something new to any of us that have been following the show. In fact, I think that it would be a pretty poor show actually, if they recreated the books word for word. Uh, the reason for that, by the way, is that it, there's a lot of difficulty in translating internal monologue to the screen. Again, go see the 1970s Dune adaptation to see how bad that turns out. A lot of the personality of the characters that we love, they have to show us somehow rather than us getting to see it play out in their head. Because of that, they have to add different scenes to kind of show those traits. Again, right off the bat, that's not gonna be the same show as the books. They literally cannot just word for word take the book and put it on screen. That's just one of many reasons why changes are necessary. I won't get into all of that now. But what has been important to me and what Rafe has stated was important to him was that at the core that this stayed the wheel of time and the characters were true to who they were. This is something that Brandon Sanderson is said is very much intact from the scripts. He said it feels like the wheel of time 
and the characters at their core are the characters. I mean, that's the great part here. He offered something up to those of you who are upset at hearing that there are gonna be changes. He said to think of the TV show as another turning of the wheel. It's the same story, but with some minor changes, but at its core, it's the same thing. So I love that way of thinking about it. I think that's the way I'm gonna think about it. I'm not expecting this to be the exact recreation of the books. Just think about it. I mean, if time is cyclical in the Wheel of Time universe, this is just another turning of the wheel. Great way to think of it. Also on the topic of the TV show though, Rafe was asked how Masa'ana could be expanded in the show. And he said he could not answer that question because anything that he would say would cause speculation and people would read into his words. So based on that response, I'm gonna go ahead and read into his words. What I don't think that his non-answer means is that Mesa'ana is in the first season or is taking on an early role in the show. I don't think that at all. What I do think it means is that there are some interesting things going on with what they might do with the Forsaken. We don't have any castings or confirmations that we know of, but then again, He's read the scripts. I don't think that because we don't have any casting that that means they've been cut from the show. They might not be in season one. They might, who knows. But I don't think he wants to tip their hand about what they might be doing with the Forsaken. For example, if they wanted to hide one of the Forsaken in plain sight, he doesn't want to hint that that's a possibility. I think it's smart for Brandon to not answer the question, but it certainly isn't keeping us from reading into his words more. So let's move on to some more book related questions that he was asked that I thought were really cool. He was asked what scene he wrote that he would be most excited to see on screen if the show makes it that far, which we're hoping it does. He said that he most wants to see Rand's epiphany on Dragon Mount. So Rand kind of coming to terms with who he is. I think that that would be a truly badass scene actually up at the top of the mountain commanding all of the Sidene and the storm raging above him. I agree. I think that would be a very cool visual. It's a very uh, emotional moment. So I think that would be really awesome. I also think, though, the last battle in general would be pretty damn cool to watch, right? Uh, there's the scene in Towers of Midnight where Rand, like, destroys an army of 100,000 Trollocs. That would be pretty badass. Egwene using the Flame of Tarvalin. That would be badass. There's actually just a lot of moments. Hinderstap would be really cool. Anyways, tons of stuff that I think would be cool there, but I agree Rand's epiphany would be awesome. Brandon was asked who his favorite secondary character was, and without any hesitation at all, he said it was Talmanes. Now he explained that he gave his own interpretation of Talmanes' character when he wrote it for the books. He basically expanded the character until he was almost a main character, but still kind of a side character. Now I did enjoy Talmanes, but I will admit that I was one of the people who felt that change when Brandon took over. I felt like Talmanes kind of became too much of comic relief in the last three books. I'm curious what you guys think about the changes in Talmanes' character, but to me, he kind of turned into a little bit of comic relief. I know some people love that. I was kind of eh on it. Now, I will add my own headcanon for Talmanes uh, in honor of Pride Month. I have always kind of considered Talmanes to be a gay man in my own head. That's never really indicated in the books. Again, we're talking about headcanon. That's my headcanon. There you go. Brandon then was asked a question that I have long debated with people in my Discord and even on my podcast. And that was, did Cad Swain continue Egwene's reforms of the White Tower when she became Amarlin? Now, Brandon answered that he largely thinks that Cad Swain did continue many of the reforms, but probably at a slower and more organized pace than the kind of rapid change Egwene was forcing. And I completely agree here, actually. I think Cad Swain was largely a pragmatist. Uh, I think that she would see a lot of value in what Egwene was changing. And she has a lot of experience and wisdom, and I think she would probably implement those changes, albeit a little slower, probably more effectively. Cad Swain, think about it, had a great working relationship with the Aiel Wise Ones. She had dealings with the Sea Folk. I mean, they hated her, but she knew of the kin. She seemed to buck at the idea that those that are stronger in the power should automatically be superior because she kind of values what people can do. An example of that is Daigion, who was the weakest Aes Sedai, but Cad Swain elevated her. Now, I certainly don't care for Cad Swain at times, but I also think there's a lot more to her character than most people give her credit for. Um, I'll probably have to explore that a little bit more in a future video to explain what I mean, because I know a lot of you are instantly like, I hate her, that bitch. But... Nevertheless, I kind of like her a little bit more than most people. In any case, I completely agree with Brandon that this is likely what would have gone down. Now, Brandon was then asked the question, 
is there a major thing that you disagreed with from Robert Jordan's notes? And he went on to say that while he didn't necessarily disagree, he didn't have much material to work with regarding Pat on Fane, and he was not happy with the ending that he ended up giving him. He said that in hindsight, he might have found a different way to involve him in the story and give him kind of a more climactic role in the story, really, because he frankly kind of dies in an anticlimactic way. Like, it's a building, and then it's just, oh, it happened. Brandon thought that might be enough because he didn't have a lot to work with, but he wishes he would have taken a few more chances there. And I, I would agree with that. I think that's one plot thread that had a lot more potential and just kind of fizzled. Another thing that he mentioned here was that he was very uncomfortable having Cad Swain spank Semarag, even if that was in the notes. He doesn't like spanking as a form of punishment or humiliation, and he states the obvious thing that a pseudo-sexual act to punish a woman is probably not appropriate then, uh, but definitely not appropriate by today's standards. And I'm glad to hear him say that, because I don't think it was completely intentional that Robert Jordan was trying to dehumanize women or anything like that, but I do think it reads that way at times, and I'm glad to hear Brandon call it out. Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about in this video was a comment that Brandon made about how Harriet encouraged him to be daring when finishing the books. Harriet wanted him to push it with ideas for the story and not play it safe. She wanted him to add his own ideas and flair while keeping it at the core of the Wheel of Time. He stated that she could have easily gotten a ghostwriter, hired somebody just to finish it and try to be Robert Jordan and write like him, not really take chances. But she specifically wanted him to interject, make some daring moves in the story, and that she would curb him if he went too far. An example of this that he gave was Avienda's trip to Roideon. The entire idea of the Terangriol taking her forward in time was an idea that he had, and I think it went over very well. It was actually a really cool callback to the Shadow Rising when Rand went through the Wayback Terangriol. I'm, for one, really happy that he took some chances with it, even if I don't agree in every direction that he went. If he hadn't, I'm worried that trying to write in another person's style for a ghostwriter would have come across very sterile and bland. I feel, by the way, the same thing about the show adaptation. So I want them to keep the story true to the story, and I want to keep the characters true to who they are, but I, I kind of want them to swing for the fences in terms of trying to translate it well, and I feel like some freedom to have some artistic vision, as Robert Jordan isn't here to give them that, is probably necessary in making a good adaptation. Anyways, what do you guys think of Brandon's interview? Make sure to watch the whole thing on the Dusty Wheel uh, because I barely touched on half the stuff they talked about. You can find a link to that video in the description of this video. Also, make sure again to like this video and subscribe to the channel to be updated when I release new Wheel of Time content. That is all I do here. Check out my Patreon if you want to support the channel and the content going forward. Don't forget to check out Audible and get your free audiobook. Anyways, guys, thanks for watching and until next time, peace out. Think you're in the kitchen with a job of work to do Mistress up above, slipping on a robe of blue She prances down the staircase, a fancy us a free Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?